I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. We are continuing a series that I really am excited about. As we talk about the focus on niches being important, we're going to continue this kind of discussion about which individual niches and what metrics and how do we work with those individual groups. So law firms is one of our niches in, digital, in addition to digital service agencies, cannabis, transportation, some of those. So today we're talking about the four metrics for law firms. My name is Tom Waddleton. I am a virtual CFO at Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. I do focus more on the digital services niche and not on law firms. So we've got an expert to talk about that area, which is exciting. At the same time, a lot of the things that we talk about are similar across these different niches. So if we go to the next slide, I'll introduce our speaker briefly and let him introduce himself. So, Well, well Tom, yep. before we get ahead, there, John. we think, I'm John Scott, and there are four main metric areas that we think law firms should focus on yeah. in order to help them achieve their goals. And if you think about setting goals for your firm, you have to think about it as laying out a roadmap to achieving those goals. Mm -hmm. And you have to have great financial and, and great data in order to hit that roadmap. And you need to monitor that. And if you think about this, this is very similar to when our grandfathers took the family on a family vacation. And before he piled everyone in the family station wagon, the night before he pulled out a 10 year old Atlas and he took down some notes. He knew he was gonna go on 55 South. He was gonna hit Mississippi, cut across there, cut across Alabama. And when he got into Florida, he was gonna hit highway 10. And when he saw his beach, he was gonna head South. But <laughs> he had 10 year old information and he could only react to what was in front of him. And that's much like many bookkeepers and CPA firms today. They're giving you historical mm -hmm. out-of-date information that you can't really do anything other than react to. Now, our parents, they had a little bit better information. They were AAA members. They got AAA Terp Techs, and that map was more current. It was handheld, and it would point out things that were known like construction in Jackson, Mississippi, yep. and it would allow them to know that they would have to take a detour, but they were still reactive and the information wasn't instantaneous. Today, what we can have in your accounting system is instantaneous, accurate information. And it it's a lot like Google Maps and Waze. And think about it, if you're taking a trip today, you plug in your destination and Waze will tell you, hey, a half mile up ahead on the right side, there's a stalled car. So you can expect traffic to slow down or It'll tell you two miles ahead, there's a major accident and the road's closed. And oh, by the way, here's a workaround so that you can yep. stay on track. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with metrics. We're trying to focus on accurate, instantaneous data so that we can achieve our goals by making course corrections or pulling levers. So this is going to be you're still on the fastest route. Exactly. Approach, right. Yeah, that's right. exactly right. Hey, we can save you 15 minutes or you can sit in this traffic jam for two hours. Right. And we've assumed in the background, they've looked at these multiple scenarios that are in there. Exactly. Well, John, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your career and how you got into being an expert in the legal industry? Sure. sure. I'm a tax partner at Anders, which is a mid-size Midwest firm. And like many other tax professionals, I grew up as a generalist. I mean, we just did a little bit of everything, but I was very fortunate early on in my career to meet an entrepreneurial attorney who decided he wanted to work on his business rather than in it. And he did it by mm -hmm. focusing on data and KPIs. And by doing so, he was able to grow from one metropolitan area to nationwide. He had a boutique firm. He figured out how to standardize processes. He knew the data that was involved in expanding, and he did that by making financial decisions based on data. I worked with he and his firm on the finance committee for over 17 years. I watched him make good choices. I watched him make a few mistakes, but when he made a mistake because he was paying attention to the data, he was able to course correct and alleviate that mistake very quickly. So while I would never take complete success for his, or complete credit for his success, I do think I earned the equivalency of a PhD in law firm management while working. Mm -hmm. with that. So we at Summit Virtual CFOs Services by Anders, we like to focus on profit-focused accounting. And it's a system that helps clients accomplish their financial goals by breaking down their revenue into non-financial drivers. 
And unlike revenue numbers, non-financial drivers can be consistently controlled and monitored through clear metrics. So remember, what we're talking about is not your grandpa's CPA firm. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is if I ask you how much cash you have in the bank, you know because you're not waiting until the 15th day after the month end to get a reconciliation from your bookkeeper. So when you set out to achieve your firm's goals, we want to map out a roadmap that gets you there. It's great. And many firms have aspirational goals. They want to grow 20% and not have any impact on net income. But unless you know the firm's capacity mm -hmm. and how much new work is coming in, there's no way that you can ensure you will achieve those goals without looking at the data. So we want you to use data not only to set your goals, but to make course corrections and ensure you achieve your goals. Yeah. And so, John, just a point I'll make on that slide, if you don't mind, the yeah. non-financial metrics, the one additional thing that I love about that is that's the language that our business partners speak more than the financial language. In the example you gave, like 20% is an excellent one, that that's a great goal. Once you understand the drivers, you can start breaking that into, okay, can I provide the number of hours of service to do that? What kind of customers would this be? Have I had this kind of trend before? All the things that what we have found is usually in the financial statement discussion, the better conversations are when you're spending more time on the non-financial metrics than the, do the dollars just sort of happen. But you're like, you got the customers you wanted, you delivered the hours, you delivered the rate you wanted. Yes, results were really good to do that. And so that's where we found our clients get much more engaged is when they can really understand and react to those numbers or to the drivers. I totally agree. And I think you're also breaking it down into smaller pieces that yep. people think, hey, I can move this lever and I can move this lever and look at the result that it produces. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you'll talk about that in the forecast discussion. So the four metrics that we like to focus on, and they have sub metrics and levers within each of them are cash, financial, production, and pipeline. And if you pay attention to these, you can make proactive decisions rather than reactive. And the first one is cash. It's everybody's favorite. Here is a quote on cash. The point of this quote is cash is king. And I've got a partner who's now retired, but he used to preach to us that I can't eat whip and I can't eat AR. And his point was <laughs> you have to bill and collect to be a viable firm. You can be the best attorney you are in your area. You can be the, the, the subject matter expert. But if you don't bill and collect, you won't have a firm. Also, your firm has to have and enforce billing and collection policies. When younger partners start to bill for the first time, I often say to them, hey, you get a new client, send them small early bills. Because mm -hmm. if they pay those within our terms, then they have the ability to be an A client. If they don't, you can cut your losses and move on. The other part of this is, you have to hold your partners accountable. The partners who are doing billing have to adhere to our policies. And then you have to train your clients to adhere to our policies. Because if we have a policy that says bills are due 30 days after they've been sent out, yep. and we consistently let a client pay in 45 or 60 days, we are agreeing with the client that it's okay to do that. So we have to train right. those clients to be better clients. Yeah, I like your story about doing that early too, because- Get on those clients who want to pay slowly right off the bat, and you'll get them in a habit of doing it. But let them pay late for a year and then try to change them. That's that's a tall order to try and change at that it's point. way too late at that point. And then yeah. it's an adversarial conversation. Yes. So we think you should have two things in mind when you look at cash. Mm -hmm. Operating cash should equate to two to six months of expenses, but an easy way to calculate that is 10 to 30% of your forecasted revenue. The other bucket of cash that you need to think about, because we assume most of you are organized as a flow through entity, is that the partners pay the tax on the income from this activity. So you mm -hmm. need to have and distribute 40% of net income in order to give the partners the cash they need to pay the tax yep. from the firm. So a quick example of that, and this is an example on the income statement that we'll look at throughout this presentation. This firm has $3.7 million in revenue. My cost of goods sold line is not just my direct labor for the billers, but also the overhead piece of that. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why that's important later. We have a gross profit of 58%, and this firm makes just over a million dollars or 29%. 
So 10% of this top line number is $371,000 and 30% is a million one thirteen. So what makes the difference between a 10% firm and a 30% firm? It's really risk. Yep. I'm a firm that's billing every two weeks on an hourly basis and my clients pay me by return mail. I'm going to skew more towards this 10% rate. If I'm a contingent fee-based firm where I have big paydays, but I don't know when they're coming or, mm -hmm. or how they're coming in, I'm going to be more of a 30% firm because I have to finance those cases along the way. Also, if, if I have no big purchases on the near term, in other words, I'm not going to do an office build out, I don't have a big technology purchase, then I don't need to accumulate more than 10% cash in, mm -hmm. the, in the bank. But if I do have one of those purchases coming up, let's say I'm going to spend a half million dollars on new computers, then I probably want to squirrel away and get from 10% closer to the 30% number. Yeah. The one other I would highlight in there, John, is that customer concentration toward the end. If you're lucky enough, and I'll use lucky in quotes, to have that huge customer that's been with you forever and maybe they're 40% of your revenue, that's risky if they leave. And I unfortunately had a client that by far their biggest customer pulled back. It was Intel, so a large company, and it ended up folding his company that he had not prepared well enough for what that was going to be. And we kept telling him and he just kept saying, I'll take the risk of that happening. So when you see that having the cash so that if he had enough cash, he could have at least chosen to make some change more slowly than having this dramatic impact on his revenue. You are exactly right. And way back when, early in my career, I had a, um, a mortgage loan originator as a client. And it was by far my largest client. It was 25% of the revenue mm -hmm. that I brought in. And I thought, boy, this is great. You know, yeah. the first bill I sent out, I was a little nervous, but then it was every two weeks I was sending out a bill and they were paying it. But when the, when the economy seized up in 07, 08, they went out of business and it took me a while to recover from that. So yeah. that does increase your risk if your clients are concentrated into one or a few clients. Yeah. Okay, cash accounts. We want to talk about what kind of cash accounts we should have. And the only thing I want to point out here initially is we're not talking about your client trust account. You could have a million dollars in client trust, but you have an offsetting liability that covers that. So that's it's not your money, so we're not going to talk about it. So yeah. the 10 to 30% would be in this general or cash reserve account. And we think in your general account, you should keep maybe a couple of payrolls in one month's expenses, and then sweep everything else into an interest bearing account, especially these days where, you know, interest rates are ticking up. You may as well make yes. a little bit of money on that. Mm -hmm. And then of course that tax reserve account, that could be the same as this cash reserve account. We're going to pay that out on a quarterly basis. So you should earn some interest on it until we get it paid out. And then the last thing I want to talk about here is we think every firm should have a line of credit and we think the line of credit size should equate to that 10 to 30% number we covered. I'm not saying you should dip into the line of credit. You should always be on the line, but it should be there as a safety net in case you need it. Yeah. And some people do ask us, do we really think you should have a separate account? And we do think that that's a good idea. We don't think just having all these in one account and then somehow keeping track of it makes sense, especially to your point about you can do interest bearing accounts for that, but really keep those dollars separate. Right. And it instills a discipline so that you can, mm -hmm. you know, hit the goals that you need to operate your business. So let's talk quickly about the cash flow cycle. It lo looks at annual revenue divided by the number of days in the year, multiplied by your usage. How many days does it take us to collect AR? And how many days do we pay our bills in? And in our example, $3.7 million in revenue, we collect our AR on average of 45 days and we pay our bills in 15 days. So if we break that down, it's 10,171 per day. We have 30 days in the month. We can see that that comes out to 305 that's really close to our 10% number. So I think that's a good sanity check to tell us that the quick math bears out in the actual formula. 
Yeah. And the main reason we really like the 10% is exactly what you said, John, that quick math. That there are other ways people can calculate, but you can make it so complicated that having in your mind, what's my annual revenue? And if I'm say 20%, I land in the middle, what 20% of that's pretty easy to calculate to say, am I sitting in that kind of dollar amount for my, or do I need to be saving more money? Totally agree. So again, we have the cash reserve and the operating account cash reserve we're earning a little interest on. How can we improve that? If we're finding that we're not where we need to be, what do we need to do to get to our target? Well, one way we can do it is accelerate our collection of accounts receivable. And here's the cash flow cycle. I'm not going to go through the formula, but this firm in particular had $20,000 in the bank. They Their AR turn is 60 days. And you can see in the next month, they're going to have to hit the line of credit to cover that shortfall. If we could increase that turn from 60 to 40 days, or rather decrease it, make it better, you can see that we never hit the line of credit. And we, mm -hmm. we're not quite to our cash target, but we're getting there. And if we could hit Nirvana and match up our AR days with our AP days, then we're in much better shape. So the point is, Adhering to your policies, training your clients better, and shortening that AR turn will help us improve our cash position. Remember, in our example, we were paying our bills in 15 days. We could also stretch that to 30, and that would help us increase our cash position. Mm -hmm. So taxes. Taxes don't focus on the top line, but rather a percentage of the bottom line. And in our case, we're going to assume everybody's in the highest tax bracket and you have a state income tax liability. So for ease of calculation, we will take 40% of net income, $430,000. Now, each of your partners probably has their return prepared by a CPA. And when they did their return last year, they got estimate vouchers for this year that kept them safe from penalties. So in this situation, the safe harbor amount for the partner is $300,000. They're going to pay that quarterly at $75,000 a quarter. We're going to look at our financial statements on a quarterly basis and take 40% and distribute that to them. So in the first quarter, we're distributing $108,000 and they have to pay 75. So they have an excess of $33,000. In the second quarter, income for us ticked down a little bit. So we only distributed $72,000. Their voucher is higher, so they're short three, but remember we gave them an extra 33. If we take this throughout the whole year, we will have distributed $430,000. They've paid $300,000, and oh, guess what? There is a balance due when they file their return mm -hmm. of $130,000, and we've provided that money. So yeah. at least for their liability from the firm activity, we've covered that, and I think most flow-through entities are in that same situation and they do that. Yeah, and where we see people get in trouble is when they don't think of it this way, you may have the partner seeing, say you don't set this money aside, you're seeing a really large balance in your cash account. So the partners may decide to take a personal distribution and then the tax return comes due and they're saying, oh my gosh, here's this nearly half million dollar bill that we didn't plan on. If you're setting the money aside when you earn it, you just know that it's there. And then you really feel like you got a good handle. And so if your tax reserve is fully funded and your cash reserve is fully funded, then you should feel really comfortable taking the money out because you've covered your basis. You're exactly right. And I call that staying behind the cash flow curve. Too many business owners and especially lawyers want it. They see money in the account. They don't think they need it, so they take it. And once it's in their pocket, you know, that's their money. And then yeah. when you have a shortfall or you have to pay taxes, you know, it, it's that they're ahead of the cash flow curve and we want them to be behind the cash flow curve. Yeah. So again, the best time to ask for credit from your bank is when you don't need it. Because in reality, there's only three places you can get money. You can contribute capital, which is what you did when you started your firm. You can improve your days in WIP and AR, and we talked about that in our quick example. Or you can borrow on a line of credit. And again, we think your line of credit should equate to it about what your cash need is. Now, let's talk about debt. There are good uses and bad uses of debt. A good use of a line of credit is to cover a dip in operating cash flow. You should never use a line of credit or debt to make partner distributions or to, port, to support partner lifestyle. Remember, I want you staying behind the cash flow curve. Mm -hmm. And term debt, term debt is really good. 
we talked about earlier that you might want to squirrel away some more cash if you anticipate a big capital project coming up. Let's say you're going to do an office build out or you're going to spend a half million dollars on some new technology that'll make you more efficient. If we look at a viable firm and a partner group, I would like to look at that partner group and see younger partners, middle-aged partners, and older, or as HR would call it, more experienced partners. Because I've constantly got partners retiring and new partners coming in. But if I take a one-year hit for a half-million-dollar technology purchase, mm -hmm. and I expense it, and I spend my own operating cash on that, that's not fair to some segment of our partner group. I would rather say okay, I did put a little extra cash away, maybe $100,000 of the 500. I'm going to borrow the other 400 and term it out over five to seven years. That does a couple of things. It's, it, it smooths out the cash flow and it terms out the debt so I can match that debt with my depreciation expense and really keep net income on a trend that's fair to the entire partner group. Yeah. And as we talked about risk with the cash reserve, that decision might have you say, maybe I go from 10% to a little bit higher because now I've got ongoing payments. And so I need to account for those. And so you can balance that out. I love your picture being the cookie jar, right? <laughs> you don't want to spend all your time taking cookies out of the cookie jar when it's your line of credit. That's right. That's right. Save those for Christmas. Yes. Okay. The next metric we want to talk about is financials. And what do we think net income should be? Well, it depends on firm size. Net income for professional service firms and law firms in particular is usually between 20 and 50%. Now, the 50% firms are smaller, they're sole practitioner, more nimble with little or no overhead. And the larger the firm gets, the lower the percentage goes. But remember, we're talking about percentages here. I would rather have 20% of 10 million than 50% of a million. But Maybe you don't want to be involved in a larger firm. Maybe a certain level of income is good for you. We work with clients to get them from their current place to their desi desired destination, and we plot a roadmap accordingly. And if we focus on the data, we can make course corrections to get them to their goals. So we're back to the same simple example that we're using. Remember, in this example, uh, we have $3.7 million in income. This is 10 billing professionals on a blended basis. And uh, these are non-partners. The partners get this piece down here. We're, we're including their salary, which in this case is $125,000 on average. And we're including the burden rate there. So the burden rate is going to include payroll taxes, pension expense, health insurance, et cetera. We've done that at 25%. That gives us a gross profit percentage of 58% and net income of 29%. Now, it's important to note that in our, our model, we're asking our folks to work for that $125,000 salary, 45 hours per week or nine hours per day. Mm -hmm. That's 2,340 hours per year. I don't want your financial statements to be all over the board. I don't want them going up and down every other month based on collections. This is cash basis, and this is not what we're shooting for. What I do want to point out, though, is that cash follows the accrual basis. In other words, if your firm is trending up 15%, I can bet you that your cash collections are up, but they're up 12 or 13% because cash basis follows the accrual. Conversely, if the accrual basis is trending down 10%, then I can predict the future and tell you that your cash collections going forward will be lower as well. So what do we want your financials to look like? Well, we want them to be on the accrual basis. You're not going to pay taxes on the accrual, but I want you to track them on the accrual so that you can match revenue with expenses. I want them to be consistent in how you treat certain items so that we can compare this month, this year versus the same month last year. So that's prepaid expenses, reserves, and other accruals. And I want them to be reliable. And, and I have here, in accordance with Gap Light. I don't think any firm that would be listening today would need to have gap statements for the bank, need to have an audit, but accrual gets us close enough to gap to be gap light. They need to be consistent in nature. And most importantly, I want to standardize them 
for firms similar to you, same type, same size, so that we can benchmark and compare you to other firms. So here's the base forecast. And when we set out to achieve your objectives and your goals, we're gonna ask you certain things. In other words, how many hours do you expect our 10 professionals to bill? And in this case, it's 1,650 hours. What's the standard rate? $250 an hour. How much of that rate do we realize when we send out a bill? And you can see that we match up with the million seventy-three. Now, this is a very simplified example. And at the end, I'll tell you in a real world where this example came from. But I want to show you the power of <clears throat> if we ask for an increase in the expected charge hours, what it has on the, the effect on the bottom line. If yeah, we exactly. simply ask, Tom? John, if I could just make one point here on that base, because I think that's so powerful. And I think, as you know, many of our new clients don't even have a forecast coming in. So just telling them, okay, from what you've told me about your business, this is what you can see. And I've looked at your historical expenses and what you pay your employee and all these things, and they can look at that number. And once you get them grounded in that, then you've got a really good model to say, what if we made some changes? And on the bad side of work started dropping off, at what point might we lose money? And you're going to show us an example to say, what if you made some changes and things could look better that you can really test out and understand versus just jump in and say, let's just try something and hope that good things happen. Right. And that let's just try something. That is uh, our grandfather's accounting firm too. Yes. <laughs> so if we ask our folks to charge two more hours per week, the 1650 goes to 1754 you can see it has a dramatic impact on net income. And if we supercharge that idea and also increase our efficiency from 90 to 92%, it gets even better. And mm -hmm. you can see on the comparison table, we can generate another $322,000 of cash flow and profit just by getting a couple more hours per week and a little more efficiency from our same staff. We're not incurring any new cost. And the real life example that this came from was I worked with a firm that was experiencing higher than normal turnover in its younger staff, and they couldn't understand why. And we ferreted out the reason was that the staff didn't feel like they had a good work-life balance. So mm -hmm. the solution that we came up with was, hey, we'll give you additional PTO, but here's what we need in exchange for it. And the younger staff ate it up. They were happy to work a little bit harder and a little bit more focused during that time to get additional PTO time throughout the year. And it was a win-win for both sides because while they didn't see the increased cash flow, what they saw was they had happier folks and they retained them longer, which in these days is really tough to do. I love that example of advising clients. John, because as your advisor, you're able to go and say, if you could get yourself from the 1650 to 1754, just charge two more hours a week, you can make essentially a quarter of a million dollars. How might we do that? And it's counterintuitive to say, I've got a staff that doesn't have good work-life balance. And your solution was to have them build two more hours a week. But the way they did it and said, you get PTO, they saw that as more work-life balance and it was a win for them and the company made more money. But you advising them, I mean, the, the owners can see, well, here's the impact if I can make this work. Yeah, they were in disarray because people were quitting. They didn't know why. We had It took some time to figure that out. But once we figured it out, then we were able to pull some levers and make a horse trade of, okay, give us a little more while you're here and we'll give you more time off. Yeah. So- Production is the next metric area that we want to look at. And we're going to talk about a few definitions here. Weekly expectation. That's the number of weekly billable hours to the total hours available per week. And in our case, it's 45 on this total hours available per week. Mm -hmm. Utilization rate. That's your total billable hours to the total working hours. And remember, for us, that's 2340. Standard bill rate. This is the rate that you tell the world you charge out. In our example, we're using 250. It's a blended standard bill rate. In other words, some of our professionals are lower than that rate, some are higher, but for ease of math, I blended it to 250. Average bill rate is a, a concept that is, it, it's the standard bill rate, but it's a, judge, a value judgment that the biller makes when they take a look at the whip that's in a client matter. 
there might be $3,500 in the whip and the, and the biller decides it's only worth $3,000. So they write it down. So if I look at total revenue divided by the number of billable hours, I can come to an average bill rate. So if I wrote my standard rate down by 10%, my average bill rate would be 225. But the billers make those decisions based on client value. But I would like to point out that I want to encourage people to push the standard rate and accept a lower average bill rate because you're leaving money on the table. Sometimes our people are very good and efficient. In fact, I had a conversation with a managing partner about six months ago, and she was bragging about somebody who had an average bill rate that met or exceeded her standard bill rate. And my immediate thought was, you're not charging a high enough standard rate for this person. They're <laughs> better than what you're charging and you're yeah. leaving money on the table. Yeah. So effective bill rate is a very powerful topic. It's total revenue divided by the number of total hours paid. And remember, this is the reason, this is the other half of the equation. When we looked at our fully loaded cost, this effective bill rate tells us the number of dollars that they're contributing on an hourly basis, whether or not they're charging the client. So yep. for all 2,340 hours, you can come up with a number that they're contributing to revenue. And when we can charge, when we compare that to their fully loaded cost, we can determine a gross profit, not just individually, but team wide for that same thing. Yep. And that one is so powerful if, for example, you give people more PTO or you just don't have work for people to do, you could be patting yourself on the back because your average bill rate is really high, but your revenue is dipping because what you don't realize is you're just not getting the number of hours through there. And so knowing that effective bill rate becomes really important. Otherwise, like I said, you can be bragging about, wow, I'm getting $400 an hour. Yeah. And no one's billing anything because they're always on vacation or you don't have the work for them to do. And I'm, char I'm charging 10 hours a month, but you're right. Yes. That effective yes. bill rate is a no cheat, no cheat rate. Right. So when we forecast revenue, we want you to not just take the year and divide by 12. We want to look at the number of networking days each month. And each month is a little bit different. You can see in this example, mm -hmm. uh, August has 23, the others have 21 and 22. And then we want to look at the total working hours available. And this is how we get to the 2340. So the working days in the month times nine gets us to 2340 for the year. Mm -hmm. It would be great to think that every available hour was chargeable, but it is not. We have holidays, state and federal, PTO, training time, internal and external. And then we have coaching and admin. So we, in our example, have come up with about 408 hours of non-chargeable hours, giving us available charge hours of 1,932. From there, we need to determine our weekly expectation percentage, weekly or annual, it doesn't matter. So we're going to say of those 1,932 hours, we want 85.5% to be chargeable. And then we come up with total billable hours. So 1,932 available times our 85.5%. Total billable hours, 1,652 mm -hmm. on average. When we calculate utilization, it's important to note that it's not always the same. We'll have an annual number, and in this case, it's 68%, but each month is different. Each month has different holidays, different number of working days, different days. You know, PTO is bunched into the summertime, and it's bunched into year-end when people are trying to, to take off uh, time. So if we look at our total billable hours, and in this case, the actual billed hours were 1580 compared to the total hours, we get an annual utilization of 16 or 68%. But each month, that's going to be dependent upon the, the total hours worked versus the total billed hours. It's not a static percent percentage. It is at the end of the year, but on a monthly basis, it's going to go up and down. And so when you can see, we expected utilization to be 93 in February and in May 51. Th this is where clients, uh, you know, they get behind early in the year. They don't pay attention quick enough. They get to the fall and they say, oh, we're going to catch up. Well, it's really tough to catch up in the fall because you don't have that same capacity to get caught up. Yeah. 
Yeah, we also find that we've got some clients who have a full week in December between Christmas and New Year's. They take that week. It's a company closed week, which is wonderful. But usually when we look at their forecast, they break even or lose money in the month of December. And so you can take that into account and often they're okay with that. But you're saying we're going to have, we better have good months early in the year because when you get to December, you are going to lose money. And then when you do, you're kind of comparing to what you expected to happen, but you get to look across this and say, so I expect to have really high utilization in February where there aren't many holidays because it's going to be terrible when you get into, looks like for you, that's more like a November kind of time frame. Right. And it would be a morale killer if you said, Hey, we're behind and I don't care about holidays. I don't care oh, about your family work life. Yes. Well. You need to <laughs> Just, come in and get this work done. You're going to lose those people. So that that's not a good sure. thing. You need to do that much earlier in the year so you yeah. can stay on track. Average bill rate. Remember, our standard rate was 250 when we, this is what we expect to write down. And we usually say about 10%. That's fine. When you actually do the bills and you make a value judgment, that's when you're going to determine this. But for our purposes, we're using 90% realization or a 10% write down to get an average bill rate of 225. So we can determine individual revenue. If we take the actual billed hours times the average bill rate, this individual contributed $355,500. We can also look at team revenue by looking at FTEs. Now, in our example, we have 10, but that could be five full-time professionals working 2340 mm. and, and 10 part-time people working half that. Yeah. So FTE is who's a full-time equivalent. You know, a lot of places today, especially when people leave big law and go to a smaller firm, they're not looking to work 3,000 hours a year. They want to come back and say, you know, I'll work half time. In mm -hmm. fact, I know a firm here in town that um, she came from big law. She's the owner partner. And when she finds these people who leave big law, she says to them, how many hours do you want to work and how many do you want to bill? And when they give her the answer, she says, okay, I'll pay you this for that. Mm. And they're very happy to come in and bill 600 hours and work eight or bill a thousand hours and work 1500. They're very happy to make a deal where they can say, if I do this, I'll get X. And so that's how she's built her firm. That's wonderful. So utilization rate is the same way. It is, uh, in our case, we have 68% utilization. If you want to calculate the effective rate, there's two ways to do it. You can look at the utilization rate times the average bill rate. You can see here it comes out to 153. You can also look at the individual revenue divided by the total number of hours, and you get the same metric. But again, just like our other indicators here, each month is going to have a different number, and we can forecast what those Number what we expect those numbers to be, and then compare it to actual to see how we're really doing in each month. So the last metric area I want to talk about is pipeline. And mm -hmm. pipeline deals with, do we have capacity to take on new work and where does our work come from? But remember, cash flow is accrual. And even though you pay taxes on the income tax basis, we want you to run your statements on the accrual basis, and then convert to cash for tax purposes. And your forecast is a roadmap to get your firm to your destination and your goals. And paying attention to data along the way allows you to make course corrections to do that. So pipeline, where do we get our work and what type of work do we get? Do we get new work from existing clients or new work from new clients? And the distinction there is annuity clients that I have for years and I keep mm -hmm. doing different things for, or am I, am I a project-based firm that does, let's say, family law? People don't get divorced every 18 months. So most of those clients are project-based. And so I have to constantly get new clients. Am I a thought leader in my subject matter area? Do I get clients because I'm the best or do I do traditional advertising? I was talking with a firm the other day, they do uh, contingent fee-based work and they do a ton of advertising. They do billboards, they do bus placards, mm -hmm. and they do some radio and TV. So they've set up a system that allows them to track initial phone calls from clients. And they ask in that call, where did you hear about us? Was it SEO mm -hmm. on the web? 
Was it a billboard? And then they track that and they track how many of those calls convert to initial client meetings and how many of those initial client meetings convert to actual client work and client matters. Wonderful so that's data. a really good way. They know their capacity and they know how much work they need to add. They can back into how many calls do we need to generate to generate a client meeting, to generate a client matter. They know exactly how to fix their capacity issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's lastly, great data that they track that. Lastly, some places get referrals from other attorneys. So we really need to focus on where does our work come from? And I think when you do this exercise of where do we get work, you can figure out the top third of your best sources of work. And you need to focus your efforts on that. But again, we have to gauge this back to, do we have the capacity to take new work? If you think about when you take your car to the auto shop because it's not working, you walk away and you pay the bill when you pick up your car and you're happy to do so. But at the same time, if you really needed that car and the guy didn't have capacity, you'd be, you'd be happy to overpay to get them to fit that in. And if you don't have capacity, you can only take on A clients. If you do have capacity, then you might be a little bit more forgiving with what you charge on that. And, and a better example of that is probably a contractor. You wanna get your bathroom redone and you get three bids. The guy who's got the most work is gonna give you the highest bid. The guy who's got good people, but he doesn't have a ton of, uh, ton of work right now, but wants to keep his guys busy and keep them paid, he's going to come in very competitively. And so I think your firms are in the same situation. If you're out of capacity, you're only going to take A clients. If you have some capacity, you might be a little more forgiving on the standard rate, and you probably take some of the B clients as well. John, so, in your experience, I'm curious with Pipeline, how mature are most of the firms when you step in to work with them with understanding this is sort of a whole process and data. You know, I think there's a good mix of people who have started firms and they're, you know, they're not brand new, but they've been a few years into it and they haven't fully been through all of these issues. And then there's some more mature firms that have been around a while and maybe they had um, a controller or a, a CFO light who really didn't focus on the, these type of metrics. There we can do a lot of value. Uh, the the larger firms that have really qualified CFOs and finance departments, they're focusing on this data. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. So let's talk about the metrics and the vital signs that you should be tracking in each of these areas. In cash, we talked about days in WIP and AR and AR aging in WIP and how we can improve our cash position based on pulling different levers. In the financial area, we talked about revenue per professional. We didn't really talk about leverage, and I want to develop that in the future because leverage is a concept of how many people that work underneath a biller or a partner. And leverage is a mm -hmm. great way to push down work. It does a couple of different things. It trains the next generation to do what you do because you're constantly pushing down work. And it frees up the partner to, be, to do higher level things. And then we talked about the charge hour expectation. So all of these levers, if you make a minor tweak or course correction, can help you improve your situation. On the production side, we talked about standard billing rate, average billing rate, mm -hmm. and most importantly, the effective rate. And in pipeline, we talked about capacity, new client opportunities, and conversion rate. The ultimate goal is to have real-time accurate data so that you can create customized dashboards. Very few of you have a background in accounting or finance and your highest and best use is in serving clients. But if we can somehow capture this data and bring it to you on a regular cadence so that you can pay attention to it, so that you can stay on track on your journey to achieve your destination. If we do that, then you're more likely to achieve your goals. This is just like the Waze app compared to the Atlas. Mm -hmm. We need to keep you with good information so that you can constantly make course corrections to achieve your goals. Yeah. So in summary, we talked about the four metric areas, cash, financial, production, and pipeline. We saw ways that we can improve your cash flow 
by improving your days to pay. We increased the charge hour expectation and we could, we saw what we could do with that. And these things, these changes make great impacts on your profit and cash flow. But just by making minor adjustments to these factors, we can achieve our goals and get to our destination. So going back to how we started with this idea of how your grandfather planned a road trip and how we do things now, your grandfather and even your parents only had access to historical roadmaps, much like many CPAs and bookkeepers that are out there today. But if you give these kinds of ideas a chance and you have good data and you can focus it in a way that allows you to make course corrections, then that's how you're going to achieve your goals. And you can even predict the future. I can tell you, you know, if, if accrual follows cash or cash follows accrual and accrual's up, cash flow is going to be up in the future. That's what we do with our clients every day. And that's what we'd love to see happen for you too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Yeah, And John, what I love about the ending piece that you talked about, we talk so much about being advisors to our clients. And so you've shown several different ways where we can help them along the way by giving this kind of advice. So if someone's watching from a law firm, hopefully they've got some really good ideas and saying, okay, I could implement several of these things. But what they might want is someone to walk along beside them and say, I can take care of some of the details in the ways app. There's a million things going on behind the scenes, but what they're seeing is a simple dashboard of saying, turn here, you're still on the fastest path. you got a roadblock coming. And that's the kind of advising role that we love to be there. And what I really love about that dashboard that you show with the lights, it's, hey, if you're all greens, keep doing what you're doing. But with the way we built this, if you're seeing red by your AR days, that's where you need to focus your attention because that's what's broken. And trust us that when we build the financial statements and the forecast, it's going to result in the kind of results that you want to see within your business. You're exactly right. And, and we want them to be able to practice law and then have someone else do the heavy lifting so that they can make decisions based on data that they know is accurate and will make a real impact on achieving their, their destination. Yeah, I think this is excellent. And what I would say to people, if they're not specific within the law niche, understanding the metrics of whatever niche you're focusing on becomes really important. And I think they can use this as an example. And we would argue in lots of niches, some of the metrics are the same as you have. But if you don't understand the metrics of the niche that you work with, this should be a challenge to go out and figure out what those are. And there's some really good benchmark information available for each niche to be able to say, here's what you should expect. And I'm sure for law firms, you're able to compare, for example, that 1,650 hours, what's typical for a law firm. And if they're way above or way below, that should be giving them some kind of a message about how they run their organization. Totally agree. And each law firm, it, although they think they're different, they're very similar, especially by type. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, John, thank you very much. This has been really helpful to, to go through this information today. Thank you, Tom.